Diana, thank you for joining me. It's lovely to have you here today. Thank you for having me, Maria. I'm really enjoying it already. <laughs> well, listen, I'm going to learn a lot from you today. So, so first of all, we all feel inspired when we see great performances. How can leaders harness that experience for their own performance? Well, you know, I think but when we see things that inspire us, we have to remember that what inspires us is also in us. So we can actually do the very things that inspire us. So I think it comes down to really caring, really investing in what you're saying. So if, some, if you hear someone who inspires you, you think, what did they just do? They really cared about their subject, or it was really important to them, or they really paid attention to me, their audience, they really cared about me. So when you see things in performance that inspire you, think about what does that give me as a performer? What inspires me as an audience is in me and I can do the same. Oh, that's wonderful. So if I see a brilliant performance, I've actually got it in me. I love that. So tell me, you say that we are both the audience and the performer. How's that possible? <laughs> well, right now we're, be we're being audience and performer. You're speaking and I'm listening, or sometimes I'm speaking and you're listening. Sometimes you're the doer and I'm the viewer and the other way around. So we're always in this interesting contract. We're always both performing those two roles in everything we do. And so I think if we understand that we are always audience and performer, then we really understand that if we want to make an impact on someone else or on other people, it starts with the impact we make on ourselves. My audience of one starts with me. Mm. What does that feel like for me? Okay. How for me. And then you are then putting yourself very sympathetically in both roles. I like that. Now, I'm going to challenge you here, though, because we talk about the importance of being authentic, and yet you're talking about performance. How do the two work together? How can you perform and yet be authentic? That's such a great question. I love it because the word authenticity gets used a lot, I agree. And it does sound like a complete contradiction to say performance in one, on the one hand and authenticity on the other. And what I mean by that is to be authentically you does not mean being habitually you. You in your life, all of us in our lives, play many different roles. We, we wear many different hats. We're a parent, or we're a wife, or a mother, or a sister, or a professional. We do so many different things in our lives, and all of those roles are authentically us, right? So really, when I say perform as yourself authentically, I mean be you, but with more skill in the different roles you have to play. Ah, fantastic. So is that when, so a lead, if a leader says to you, I want to feel more like me, is that what you're talking about? In a way, in one word, it's really talking about integration. You know, we want to be whole, all of us. You know, we often have an inside the organization self and the outside the organization self. And really what we all long for, and certainly what my clients often talk about is, how can I feel more like me? When I go through those doors, how can I feel more whole so that I'm not just putting on some mask, I'm actually bringing all of who I am in my life to the table because that's what makes the greatest contribution. All of those wonderful energies and passions and things that make me who I am. I love that. So in the introduction, we've heard that you are a theatre director. And so obviously in the theatre, you have a stage. Um, and then but what about business? Is there a business equivalent to that? Is there a business stage? How does the, how do the two meet? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I guess in, on one level, I could say when you're sitting around a boardroom table, that's a stage. You just happen to be sitting down and every space you're in, every environment you're in, in a way is in a spotlight of sorts. It's, it's saying, how can I create? the best engagement possible. How can I create a fantastic arena 
for communication and for ideas to flourish here. So thinking about the business stage doesn't have to be standing up under a spotlight in an auditorium. It's coming literally into the space with other people and creating fantastic engagement. Okay, so, so if I'm trying to make the parallel though, and I'm making fantastic engagement with my audience coming together with other people, do I, should I rehearse as you do for the stage? Should I learn my lines? Should I um, warm up? Should I, what are the things that I can take from the, the stage that I can also use in business? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think just on the simplest level, if you think about it, you think about musicians, they warm up their instrument, they play their scales. We think about athletes, they warm up their muscles. We are, you know, we are corporate, corporate athletes, if you like, in the business world. And the idea that you can go into something cold is a very strange thought to me. So I think, right, how do I need to show up in order to do what needs to be done? What need, you know, if I want a result, how do I warm myself up to myself before I even get started? How do I energize myself physically a little bit? How do I just get my voice a little bit clearer? How do I even warm up my imagination? Why am I doing this? What is it all about? My sense of purpose. All of these things are micro rehearsals. And I think they're all critical when you think, I need to bring the best of myself forward so I can't go into this cold. I have to do a warming up of this fantastic, miraculous instrument so that I can communicate at my best. And do you think, as in um, performance on stage, that you should sort of structure and prepare what you're gonna say? Should you learn it? Should you rehearse it? Would, is that part of it too? Yeah, I think, well, I think rehearsal has two functions. There's rehearsal to practice something and to perfect or polish something so that you feel really confident that you know your material. And the other sense of rehearsal is to generate your own creativity. So in other words, I think it's really interesting that we often think about rehearsal as I'm just going to write out my script and I'm gonna memorize it and then it's done. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's a living, breathing thing, performance. Every time you tell that story or talk about that subject, it should be fresh to you. It should be alive to you. So the question about rehearsal is, what else can I do just to even refresh my thinking about it? That's a form of rehearsal too. So I think rehearsal is coming back to your messages again and again and thinking, how else can I think about this? What else can I do here? to think more creatively about it, to freshen it up, to feel more energized about it myself. Otherwise things can go very stale. Mm, and you actually sort of become a bit robotic, don't you? And you sort of disconnect with the words, like definitely. Yeah. Mm. So you specialize in leadership presence. Um, I, what does that mean? <laughs> presence, this wonderful word. I love these words, presence, authenticity, performance. Um, pr Presence, I think presence is in its most obvious, simplest, and most profound sense, it is to be fully present. So when I talk about presence, of course we have the red carpet, the cameras, the best angle, understanding how your image might appear, and you have presence too about having a great, big, almost charismatic energy. Those are different kinds of presence, but I think the most profoundly important and the most rewarding presence is that capacity to truly be here now, in the moment, with the other person or other people, to really see them and for them to see you and for you to really value them. And that is the arena. You are elevating other people by being completely present giving attention, giving full attention, and being able, because you're present in the moment, to think on your feet, to be agile, to understand what's going on. What are people bringing to the table for you to pay attention to? 
because when you leave the room, if other people say, you know, I had a fantastic experience just now with Maria, or that was a brilliant meeting, that's presence. It's a powerful sense of commitment and confidence that you stir up in other people when you leave the room because you've given a true sense of arriving and being there with them. So that's what I think about presence. And of course, in order to be there, it is important to get yourself grounded and centered. There is a little bit of physical work to do in your body. You can't come rushing into a meeting all anxious and transmitting nervous energy. You need to be grounded in order to hold the space for other people. So there's a physical sense to it too. I love the fact that you said that, you know, when I leave the room, people are happy. Uh, you didn't say that, I know, but <laughs> I think that's quite amusing. So what's interesting in that, though, is to be present, it's actually really hard. There's so many distractions, especially at the time of recording. We're still virtual. I, I hope we're not going to be virtual forever. But, you know, it's very hard to concentrate, be there when you've got other things on your mind. Is there a tip you can give us to be present? Yeah, you, it, just like the warming up, you can't go into these things cold. So I know that most of us have back-to-back -back meetings all day right now on screens. And even in the live world, too often we have back-to-back -back meetings. The, the big critical factor in presence and in managing is managing your energy. And to do that, you have got to leave some space and air between you and the next thing you're about to do. Even if it's 60 seconds, you have to take a moment, you have to stop, you have to take a breath, you have to connect to yourself. And then even if it's just one thought, what am I about to do? So you carry intention with you. And it only takes 60 seconds, literally. You can show up with full presence if you just do that. That's great. That's a really great tip. And I think you, you need to disconnect, don't you, from the previous thing, center, as you say, and then be ready for the next one. The other thing you talk about with, with regards to presence that's really important is the life story. How, how does that connect with presence? Hmm. Uh, um. For me, life story is an endlessly fascinating subject because obviously, when we think of our life story, it's huge. You know, we have many, many, many chapters that comprise our life story. But the, the big takeaway about our life story, however complex it is, however many chapters are in it, and however many smaller stories comprise our life story, we, you, me, we are all completely unique. There is only one of you, Maria, in all time. And so you are the author of that story and no one can tell that story as well as you can. And so when we just connect to that fact that our own story is unique and we honor that and really just value that, it's almost like a DNA building block for our presence just that notion, that extraordinary notion that we are utterly unique. And if we just pay a little attention to our own story, we just think about it, my gosh, there are so many things that I have experienced in my life. And if I just tap into a few of those moments, I'll immediately surface insights and lessons and messages that give me meaning and purpose. So if I can connect to my meaning and purpose, it, it helps inform my vision, my values, my beliefs, all of that. And boy, does that give me presence if I can start to understand that and own that. I love that. You're so passionate about it as well. It's really wonderful to hear you talk about it. So part of your story, of course, is your name and who, who, you know, it's part of your identity. And yet you, you criticize us about how we use our names or we're well, not all of us, but, um, you know, so talk to me about the problem with names. Well, Maria, I wish everyone spoke their name as eloquently as you do. So I think, you know, just in the, again, in the day to day rushing around, especially in the corporate world, 
we start taking things for granted. We rush past things and over things, and we go into our default zone. And default is efficient, but it's not inspiring, that's for sure. So I'm just amazed at how much people rush over their names or rush past their job title or their name. It's just a big mumble. And you know that experience. You ask someone their name, and they tell you their name, and you just don't hear it. You don't hear the whole name and you have to ask them again and you don't get it a second time. And by this point, you're just too mortified to ask again. So you, you kind of go along that you've got their name. And all the while, when that happens to me, I'm thinking, why are we so stingy about our names? It's as if we want to get them over with. They kind of drop into the carpet. So what I offer clients just to just to bring their name into their consciousness, literally, so they're not on autopilot, is to say something like this. It's just an exercise. They don't really do it when they meet someone for the first time, but in your head you do. The title of my life story is Diana Theodore's. Now, when I put that little story in front of it and give myself that little launch, I'm going to value my name. I love that. I love that. The title of my life story. Yeah, very good. As long as you like your name, of course, because you haven't always chosen it. But uh, and, and actors do change their names, don't they? So how, how does that work? So you, you've changed identity. You know, what's in a name? You know, it's, it's how you connect to that name. Lots of people change their names. You know, my name originally was Diane but my grandmother, who's Sicilian, called me Diana, Diana, and I became Diana. So mm. when I say Diana, it connects me to my roots, even though that's not on my birth certificate. <laughs> Fantastic, brilliant, love that. So, so tell me, um, I'm going slightly off on a tangent here, but I think it's really important. Um, there aren't enough women in senior roles. Um, you know, we see this everywhere and we don't have enough women on stages as a bureau. We don't have enough women speakers. Is there anything that women can do with regards to presence that will help them to raise their visibility, maybe, or their credibility so that they are chosen more often? I have one sentence for that, <laughs> which is, Claim the I. Claim the I. And what I mean by that is, again, as a coach, I hear not just women, but very, very frequently women will, I will ask them to tell me a story about something they've achieved that they're really proud of, something that they have contributed in the workplace. They've had a great success. And I have to stop them over and over again. And you know why? Because there's not an I in sight. It's just we. That little we loves to grab the spotlight. And I always ask, whose story is it anyway? You're not serving yourself by deflecting and thinking that you're one of the team by stepping back. There's many, many ways you can be graceful and gracious and acknowledge the contribution of others, but first you have, you have got to be able to claim the I. You've got to plant the I center stage and take ownership of your credibility and your ideas because if you're not your own talent scout, no one's gonna discover you. You have to be able to say, I led a wonderful project the team were great. I am so proud of how our team worked. But you have to claim the I for your material and your ideas. And if you could just practice that, it really does help clarify your visibility for you. So I, I tend to I tend to think about that as a, you know think about it as you know that size that we all hear about out there in the fashion world, size zero. Well, it's kind of like size zero thinking. You're invisible unless you can just graciously claim the I. Claim it. I love that. I love that. That is really good. And it's interesting that, you know, people who are very confident uh, will use I a lot. 
you know, people who have strong, strong confidence. And, and it is it's true about women. It's about other people more often than not. That is so powerful. So what about our environments and, and how they impact us? Uh, I mean, that must have an effect on, on our presence and have an effect on our ability to, you know, to do all of these things. Can we have an impact on our environments as opposed to the other way around? Can we do that? Yes. The answer is yes. You know, we, of course, every time, just think about it. Every time we go into some kind of physical space, a meeting room, whether it's virtual or live, or whether it's a large space or a small space, whatever it is, straight away, there's a question. What needs to happen here in order to get the results that we want? So for instance, if I'm about to lead a meeting, the purpose of which is to collect some creative thinking with the team. Well, what kind of environment would be conducive to that? I need to think about that. I need to figure out, is there, you know, is there enough lighting? How are we sitting? Are we in a, in a, are we around, by the way, boardroom tables are often the complete anathema of creative thinking together. You know, you can hardly even see each other or hear each other. So it's thinking, what kind of environment do I need to create, even in a very limited way? How do I create it with my energy? How do I create it with a few simple shifts of where people sit? How do I create it with the sequence of the agenda? All of those things are environment. How do I check in with the other people to get their clarity, to get their clearance, to get their attention? All of these things are about not simply adapting to the status quo, but understanding that you have a responsibility. Energy is your response ability, literally your ability to respond and create the environment that you need. And I, if I could, I just have, I just remember a wonderful experience that I had a little while back. I actually saw a woman give a lecture. She was from the oil industry. And she came on the stage and there had been a panel discussion right before her. So the stage had a table and it was covered with bottles of water. And she went up to the podium and she was about to begin and she stopped and she asked the stage hand to come out and clear all the water. And then she said, I'm here to talk about oil, not water. And I loved it because she took command of her space. She made the environment model her message. Oh, I love that. That's really good. I love the fact also that you're, you're setting the stage for success, aren't you? Really powerful, powerful. And I love the, 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 what you said. Um, your energy is your responsibility. Really powerful. So Dan, our time is up. It's gone so fast. It's incredible. What thought would you like to leave our listeners with? Ooh. I think going back to story, um, I think although everyone is in different states of busyness and in handling this lockdown time, it is a fantastic opportunity if you can take just a little time for reflection and have some fun digging into your personal archives just a little bit and reawakening some memories about your life and just valuing them valuing your own story a little bit more, bringing it into the light, kind of like an archaeological dig, going, wow, I've had such a rich life and I want to share my stories. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you.